We are talking to uh, Gaia Wins, the uh, author of Adventures in the, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Adventures in the Anthropocene or? Yeah, that's fine. Anthropocene, it's fine. You can pronounce it how you want. It's a made up word. <laughs> yes, a journey to the heart of the planet we made. Thank you uh, for talking to us today and thank you for talking to the uh, readers and listeners of Radara. Tell us what the book is all about and what the topic is all about that you're writing or discussing in the book. So the book is called Adventures in the Anthropocene, A Journey to the Heart of the Planet We Made. And it's about this idea that humans have had a planetary effect. We have so changed the planet that we're pushing it into a new geological era or epoch. We're actually, um, we're actually turning it into the new age of humans. That's what Anthropocene means. And, and how is that changing in different ways? Because I know you discussed well, several uplifting exp experiments or, or, or things that are going on around different parts of the planet, but is there a broader theme that you can discuss? Well, so in various ways, we're changing the planet. Um, so we're changing the atmosphere, we're putting different pollutants into it, we're warming it, the temperature of the atmosphere, we're changing the climate, we're, ch we're making it more extreme, unsettled, we're changing the oceans, we're warming the oceans, we're making them more acidic, we're polluting them, uh, we're overfishing, we're changing uh, biodiversity through extinction and through moving species around in ways that they wouldn't move naturally. We've uh, led a breeding process uh, for the last uh, 10,000 years or so where we've um, created plant varieties and animal varieties that wouldn't exist if humans hadn't got there. We've um, changed uh, lands, land area and land use. We've moved from a forested and savanna type um, landscape on the planet to one which is uh, dominated by uh, completely different different uses. So we have forests still, we have savannas still, but we have completely artificial landscapes like farmlands um, and um, uh, cities. So 40% uh, of the planet's ice-free land surface is now used to grow our food, for example. We've rerouted and dammed rivers. Um, we've uh, changed glacial patterns. We've uh, changed the uh, poles because they're melting. Um, uh, so uh, the uh, sea level is rising. It's we've we've had planetary we've had a planetary effect, um, and 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 it's the first time that a species has had that effect in the history of the of the um, Earth, except for um, certain bacteria which uh, populated our atmosphere with oxygen. So um, this is this is something quite novel. It's the first time um, a, a sentient being has done it, and uh, you know we're a self-aware ape. We know what we're doing. Um, so uh, we're becoming we're becoming aware now of 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 the the vast changes. You know we've got an unprecedented ways of looking at the planet, and satellite images, and and so on. Um, so so that's what the Anthropocene is. Why is it happening now? Uh, as you said, that this is a relatively recent phenomenon. In your opinion, based on your research, uh, why do you think that is happening now? Well, I mean, humans have always modified their environment to a certain extent. Um, you know, we, we cut and burnt our way through forests. We've uh, planted necklaces of rice around mountains. We've always had an effect, but until recently, they were just regional or, or local effects. Uh, now, with globalization, with um, our increasing technology, with our massive population, we um, we've we've really sped up this. And, and since the since the mid twentieth century, there's been this massive acceleration in human activities in all ways, and that's that's known as the Great Acceleration. So, um, production of everything has accelerated. Um, production of everything from food to uh, our devices, to cars, to houses, everything is, is massively increased. Um, at the same time, our human population has increased and our impact on the planet has massively increased. So um, it's it's become sort of exponential recently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just for our readers uh, who, are, who may not be aware of this term, that is made up term, uh, what does the Anthropocene mean and or how did it come about being used and how it is how it should be understood? 
Well, so um, as I said, the Anthropocene, it, it really means the age of humans. Um, so uh, it, it came about because, uh, because of, of, well, a large number of scientists were realising that we have this huge impact. And so, so various people have come up with different, different terms for it. Um, this, one, this one originates with Paul Crutzen, who's a Nobel Prize winning chemist, who, who realised that, um, as, he, as he puts it, uh, we're no longer living in the Holocene. Everything, everything has changed about our planet. It should more properly be called the age of humans, the Anthropocene. So he came up with that term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are we doing everything that is just to hurt the planet or destroy the planet? Or are we also doing things in different places that can also change things for better? Are there any experiments, as you highlight in the book, that you may want to talk about one or two that kind of also show that there is a bright light at the end of the tunnel? Mm. Well, I don't like to talk about hurting the planet. I mean. I don't think we're really hurting the planet. The planet is, um, it's not a, a living being. It's a, it's a rock, you know. Um, so we're changing it. We're definitely changing it. And, um, are we hurting it for certain species? Well, yes, we are, but other species are doing very well. Um, you know, uh, there's never been more rats. There's never been more, uh, cows. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so on, chickens. Um, so I'm, I'm more interested, really, in what it means for us, what it means for humans in the future. What, uh, because we, we are reliant on ecosystems. Um, we're reliant on fresh waters. We're reliant on a, a clean atmosphere and a stable uh, climate, certain Holocene-type temperatures. So um, what does it mean for us? That's what I'm interested in. And, and so that's what I did, really. I set off on a journey. A uh, two and a half year journey around the world, having a look at how people are living on the forefront of some of the massive changes that we are we're experiencing and that we're we're directly responsible for. Um, and I found, in some ways, you know, it was it was a, a miserable situation, but in a lot of ways, people are coming up with ingenious ways of getting around the difficulties they face. So, for example. Um, for example, one of the problems is that glaciers are melting in the mountains, in the Himalayas, for example, and uh, people rely on glacial meltwater to irrigate their crops. And without them, they, they have to leave rural communities and join the great um, urban diaspora, uh, living in slums mainly. So um, I've, I found a man um, in Ladakh, in the corner of the Himalayas, who, who is making artificial glaciers to... Um, to to create a, an ice store where where the natural ones have died, have, have melted. So that was quite remarkable. And and the uh, meltwater from these artificial glaciers was enough to to irrigate the crops um, below. So people are actually returning to that place. That was quite uplifting. Um, in other places, so for example, in the Caribbean, where there's a big there's a big uh, garbage problem. There's a big um, problem with uh, inequality and, and people not having enough uh, room to live um, in, in comfort. I found a man who's, who's made an island out of, out of garbage, literally piling up garbage and, um, and, and setting it in sand and with, um, with ocean reeds and so on. He's managed to create an island out of rubbish to live on and for his family to live on. So that was quite inspiring too. Mm hmm. Um, do you see the it's also a question between the rich and poor nations that more and more rich nations are pushing the manufacturing to faraway places in the poor areas that may or may not have enough infrastructure and where all these problems are concentrated or, or that is not something you came up uh, uh, felt across when you were doing the research? Well, yes, that's a huge problem. I mean, it's always been a problem. The um, rich areas have always outsourced their industry, whether we're talking about um, rich cities like London or New York outsourcing the, the heavy, dirty industry to um, more suburban towns or, or other cities, other poorer cities. We're now doing that on a much bigger scale. Um, first of all, it went to the Far East and now places like China, where they're they um, are trying to clean up their cities like Shanghai or um, Beijing. They're, they're now outsourcing their dirty industries further inland or to um, nations poorer than China like uh, Indonesia or, or Burma. So um, 
it, it is a, it is a, a huge problem. Um, the way we the way we the way we look at our materials, our material resources that all have to be dug up out of the ground and then formed into products that we buy and then um, often throw away. The way we look at that whole manufacturing process, this cradle to grave system really needs to change if we are going to have a healthy society and a healthy environment to live in. So it's much better to think right at the beginning when designing products and designing a need for products, because the two often go in hand in hand, that we we think about the lifespan of that product and where where the resource will end up, particularly if it's something rare or something that is expensive energetically or resource intensive to produce. So everything from um, from cell phones to um, to clothing, when we, when we make it, we need to think about how that product, where the, where the lifespan of that product ends and what, how easy it is to dismantle and reuse the constituents of it. And in that way, produce um, a circular economy. And, and there, are, there are lots of people now um, campaigning for this, but um, really it's, it's, um, it's a problem of society and industry because there's no incentive at the moment really for, um, for product manufacturers to think about the end of, end of life of their product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as you discussed in the book so well, the urbanization or the rapid proliferation of urbanization is staggering. You know, we are only now 2% of the uh, planet's land, but in less than uh, 15 years, it's going to be 10%. And as you said, in the, in the next uh, less than 80 years, that we might be building a brand new city every 10 days for 1 million people. I mean, this process is only going to accelerate. Yeah, I mean, urbanization is, is one of the, the biggest symbols of the Anthropocene. We really are living in a in a new in a new urban environment. There's never been there's never been a time when um, more people lived in cities. Already more than half of us do. Um, three quarters of us will by 2050. And that's changing the changing the landscape of the Earth, but it's also changing the way we use the planet and we use the planet's resources. So it's concentrating more of us in um, smaller areas into really what are artificial landscapes, um, but they are factories of, of the world's resources. Um, the cities use the natural resources of the world, of course, everything we use, everything we breathe, everything uh, we eat, all our building materials, everything comes from, from the natural world. Um, so it's, 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 Kind of easy to think if you're a, if you're an urban dweller if you if you live in a city that that you live in this artificial world which is completely divorced from from nature and and so and so we don't need to worry about that but of course we need to worry about it even more because even if we're not physically present there we're using those resources um, uh, more more than we ever have uh, but. But what we need to think about is what sort of city model we're going for. You know, are we going for the very compact, much more efficient high-rise um, Hong Kong variety? Or are we going for that suburban sprawl of America where everybody has their um, sort of mini ranch, yeah. essentially, which is what <laughs> these, some of these suburban houses are? Um, because that's very inefficient. Um, New York is, is one of the most efficient places in in the states and and that that's really that's really much more of a sensible model to follow and we, and we need to think about where all the new people the new city dwellers are going to live you know we're not really planning cities properly for all these new urban migrants what, what we have around the world is um growing slums you know where people live without sanitation they live without um uh, water, often without electricity, without basic requirements. And wouldn't it be better if instead of retrofitting these cities, if, if they were planned and people um, and, and city, um, city planners actually thought about the future populations that were going to inhabit them uh, at the beginning? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
You had a fascinating, as you mentioned, two and a half years of travel around the world. Would you explain or care to discuss some of the areas that you remember vividly of visiting? Because you went from all over the world, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, everywhere, Africa. Yeah, I did. Um, more than 40 countries. It was, it was incredible. Um, I started off in Asia and, and then um, sort of went from from the Himalayas down through India and um, across um, east um, through through the far far corners of Indonesia and then and then went back into Australia and then went around um, Africa from Ethiopia down so it was sub sub Saharan Africa um, Central Africa South Africa um, and then and then from Patagonia up to Mexico and then I did um, some visits in the in the US yeah you're right and and, and Europe so and China <laughs> so, yeah, it's quite, it was a big big trip but it was amazing yeah did you did you come up with the uh, assessment that you that we we are all facing the same problems and we're all in the end human beings and react to the same situations in the same way or you had a you had a totally different opinion of human race or age of human as you talk about that if, if there's a drought going on in South America or if there's a drought going on in Africa as a human being are we react to the, reacting to the same difficulty of drought condition in the same way or we all have a different ways of reacting to the same situation in your experience did you find something or sim do you find we are more similar than we are more dissimilar well well you know i mean we're all very different of course but the it, i mean the way we react to to our environmental challenges depends on 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 our economic social geographic pressures so a drought in namibia is very different from a drought in um in kenya say because there are very few people living in in Namibia, it's a desert anyway. Um, people are very well adapted to that kind of uh, life. Uh, Kenya, however, a massive and growing population, uh, which is which is really experiencing climate change because in, it didn't used to be as dry as it is. So people are having to adapt by growing different crops now. Um, same with parts of India. There used to be um, so India obviously has a monsoonal climate, but um, the monsoons have been changing dramatically, um, become much less reliable and so on. Um, and, and traditional, you know, what are traditional crops and, and what people are becoming to re coming to rely on are, are having to change. So, for example, there are, a lot of people grow cash crops, uh, which are great because they, they give you a bit of income, um, apart from the subsistence, apart from just feeding yourself and your family, so you, you have more opportunity in life. But a lot of these cash crops, if you look at them, things like cotton, extremely water intensive. So, um, so if you're spending a lot of your uh, limited water supply feeding your cotton, you're not going to have enough to uh, produce anything, you know, not enough to produce wheat or rice or, or whatever else that you're planning on um, making. So so then you have this this crazy situation where where almost feeding yourself becomes sec becomes secondary to earning a living and, and it's and it's um, when you live in that hand to mouth existence it's um, it's really it's really worrying and a lot of people live like that. I mean you discuss uh, many of the uh I guess I would call topics, atmosphere, rocks, farmland, uh, the cities and, and rising sea levels. Are there one or two that you think are far in, far more uh, imminent than the others that we should be really concerned about? I mean, they're all problems in different places. So, you know, if you're living in Bangladesh, uh, rising sea level is more of a problem than drought. Um, you know, uh, because you're living right at the edge of the ocean, you're already um, prey to typhoons and other um, storm surges and other problems, salination. Um, you're, you're, a lot of the people there who used to farm rice and now having to move to shrimp farming and, and so on. Um, whereas if you live in um, Gujarat or you live in um, part, another part of India, you're not 
inland, you're not worried about rising sea levels, you're more worried about drought. So, I mean, it depends where you're living, um, what your imminent fear is. You know, the people of New Orleans um, um, would be more worried about uh, rising sea levels, storm surges, that kind of problem, um, than drought. The people in, in California are more worried about drought. So, you know, it depends where you live. <laughs> <laughs> Do you do you have any prescriptions of what not to do as a human uh, race or things that we can avoid so that at least we don't accelerate uh, destruction that we may, we may be doing or? There's lots of things we could be doing. Um, I mean, we need to obviously move more quickly towards um, a low carbon situation. We also need to, uh, we need to have an Anthropocene mindset. So instead of, at the moment, we, we we're very much living as though it's the Holocene still, but it's not. You know, we're not living in times of um, of low human population, of plentiful resources, of a stable climate. You know, things have changed. So everything we do now has to reflect that. And it doesn't at the moment. So everything from town planning to to um, architecture, to the way we educate our children, to the way we do our farming, to the way we manage our water supply, to how we take vacations, all these sorts of things have to be done now with a mindset that we're in the Anthropocene, which is a time of high human population, low limited resources, and a very unstable and warming climate. So certain things that might have made sense in the Holocene no longer make sense. Um, and, and I think I think it's taking us quite a long time to realise that. You know, why why are people still building on floodplains when we're going to need floodplains more than ever before? You know, with this unstable climate, um, there there are, there are lots of things that we're doing which don't make sense anymore in a Anthropocene. If you have an Anthropocene mindset in the time of the Anthropocene, um, which we're doing, which we should stop doing. <laughs> <laughs> What went into the researching the books? You mentioned the travel, but are there, uh, from the point you thought about writing the book and to the point you finish it, uh, how long it took you to finish the book? Um, well, I, after I finished traveling, um, I guess it took me just over a year to, to write the book. I mean, I, I, had, um, I had my son in that time as well, so that slowed things down <laughs> as well. It took about a year, I guess. Um, from when I started writing the book to finishing it. Wow, oh, it's a fascinating read, and uh, it, it certainly makes you aware when you when you eat the next hamburger, or when you buy the next plastic product, or when you buy your next smartphone, that how it affects some other part of the planet that you may not realize. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's we're, we're, it's all interconnected. So we're very good at, at at thinking, at compartmentalizing. You know, at creating what we think is an artificial world, but we. Um, we, we sanitize the world as much as possible. We choose our own nature, our own um, gardens and parkland and golf courses and so on. Even our national parks and our zoos are massively and very carefully curated by us. There's nothing natural about about our world, and yet we don't live in an artifice. We we depend on this on the uh, on the uh, ecosystems um, around us for everything. Um, and and when we meddle with them without um, without preparing ourselves, you know, and it's not it's not necessarily negative. Um, there are there are positive consequences. You know, nature is a big scary beast. <laughs> <laughs> it's we get our diseases from nature. It can kill us in various ways. Um, everything from an uneven uneven surface where we can topple and break our legs. You know, compared to our nice. Uh, nicely flattened um, uh, stone tiles or, uh, or <laughs> carpet. You know, when we when we when we um, exclude the natural world as much as possible and and tame it for us, I mean, it's it's made us much safer. It's given us a nice warm uh, environment to live in that's at the right temperature and so on. But at the same time, um, when we, when we meddle with the with the natural world at the extent we're doing we leave ourselves open to all sorts of things like new diseases like dengue in places we didn't used to have them and, and not being able to clean our air and our water supply properly because of deforestation or because um, 
we've rerouted rivers to such an extent they can't carry out their the functions that we rely on them for. Um, so, so it's it's a it's a case of being of being slightly slightly more self aware than we are, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the book does make you a little bit more self-aware and, and what is our contribution to the destruction or changing the planet as you say, you know. Um, are you working on any other project, next project or is there a next new book coming out down the line? Um, well, I've just started researching my next book, <laughs> which is about human culture. Um, I'm just at the very early stages. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, another another big project. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time and your comments. And uh, I would certainly recommend uh, readers to pick the book and get a little bit of better understanding of how we are all changing this uh, beautiful planet we live on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was great to talk to you.